All right, everybody. Welcome to Guidestone Church. It's good to see you guys here today. And uh, thank you for joining us online as well. We're so happy that you've decided to join us. Uh, make yourself at home, especially online. Feel free to make comments in the section. In here, if you want to make comments, that's fine too. I don't, it's, all, it's all good. We, we're just a big family, so that's okay. Hey, uh, just want you guys to kind of think back over the last couple of weeks about where we've been and how God has been intersecting our world through Jesus. We've, we've seen Jesus in Cana twice now, right? Once at the wedding and once when he was healing this, uh, this official's son. And so now we're back into a new kind of area that we want to talk about. And this time I want to talk to you about the far side. Does that ring a bell for anybody? Anybody think of the far side? Yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. So I want to tell you a little story uh, about, I want to tell you about a game that our family plays called I Don't Know McDonald's, okay? And when I Don't Know McDonald's takes place, there's this ritual that we have. It's, it's right outside in the lobby here, um, right after church, and it happens Almost every week. It's, it's ritualistic, and it happens right outside in the, in the lobby of the church. And we play this game, I Don't Know McDonald's. And, and we call it that because, or I Don't Care McDonald's, and, and not I Don't Know. I Don't Care McDonald's. And, and it's this ritual that takes some time to go through. And the truth of it is that none of us really like to go through it. But we do it anyway. We do it anyway every single Weak. It inevitably has to happen. And so we've come to a point where it's not even a choice. It's going to happen. It's this weekly routine we engage in. No ability to stop it from happening. We want to stop it, but it just doesn't, it doesn't stop. And even though none of us wants to do it today, we're most likely it's going to happen. Even though I'm talking about it, it's going to happen. It begins with this question. The question starts like this. Where would you like to go eat? And that's how it begins. And then we're off. Like, sometimes the, you know, people don't even really want to ask this question. It's almost involuntary sometimes. Like, because they know that this is about to take place. They know this is about to happen. And so they, 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 they just kind of trying to hold it in. And they say, where are we going to eat? And they can't. They don't want to say it. But we're going to go through this because we know what's going to happen once this question takes place. And so we'll all be standing around having a rivet riveting conversation about life and then and about, you know, what's going to happen and, and what's going on in the new church and all of that. And then out of the out of left field, there's this question. Where do you where where are we going to eat? Where, where should we go? This one question launches us into the ritual of I don't care McDonald's. And after the question is asked, the first answer that's required, required by law, as I, as I understand it, is, I don't care. Someone has to say, I don't care. I don't care. And here's the truth of it. Even though that's the first statement, it is a total and utter lie, right? You guys know this. I don't care. It's, it's a lie, and it's a lie right in here in the church. I just want you guys to know that. When somebody says, I don't care, they're lying in the church. But you're into the ritual, and the law says that must be the first answer that, to that question. And so the ritual would be fine if it was a true statement. I don't care. It would be fine because then someone would be able to suggest a place, and, and, and we could move on. But no, it's a lie. It's a lie. It's a lie. And the lie happens in church. Next in line for the ritual are the children. They come out of nowhere. When this question is asked, where would you like to go eat? The children gather. They begin to gather and they begin to say, McDonald's? Can we go to McDonald's? Can, can we go to McDonald's today? You can already see it coming. The moment I don't care is blurted out. The children, again, required by law, it seems like, it is to jump in and smile and yell, McDonald's! We want McDonald's! Can we go to McDonald's today? Now, I don't care has already been stated. And if it were true, we could just go to McDonald's. It would be all over. We could just go. It would be great. We'd be on our way. But it wasn't true. And McDonald's is the last place that the adults want to go. Especially the person that says, I don't care. So now, because of the ritual, we must disappoint the children by telling them, no, we're not going to McDonald's. But I have to tell you, this is actually one of my favorite parts of the ritual. They have been to Chick-fil-A this week. They've, been to, they've gotten snacks at 7-Eleven. They've watched movies and shows. They've played soccer. They've been, they've been carted to and from school and church and practice. And so 
in order to be able to tell them no in this moment is actually brings me great joy. I love this moment. No. By the time this part of the ritual comes around, it's almost like, who can tell them no first? Is it going to be me or is it going to be Alicia? McDonald's, no. We got it. No. It's joined by laughter inside as we tell them no. No. Ha, 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 suckers. Little kids. The problem is that after this, the ritual really becomes troublesome. It becomes, it becomes a, a, a really a, a major problem because we move into the section called the I really don't care cycle. And that's what begins to happen after the children's hopes are thoroughly and completely dashed about going to McDonald's. They will leave the conversation only to be heard from again at the very end of the conversation once the selection is made. At which time they are required to act as if the world is ending because we're not going to McDonald's. At this point, someone will say, you know, I really don't care where we eat. And another person will say, well, I really don't care either. And the conversation will tail off into another topic. Maybe we start talking about what happened in church. And, and someone will bring the conversation back to food by saying, you know, I don't, I don't really care where we go eat. And we're in this cycle. But the problem is I'm getting hungry now. And, and, and someone says, yeah, I'm getting hungry now too. And, and we keep going down this cycle. Does anyone want to make a decision? No, no one wants to make a decision. After three or four of these revolutions, someone inevitably will say, will enter into the I just don't want to make a decision section. Well, I don't want to make a decision. I, well, I don't want to make a decision either. I, well, I've been making decisions all week on what we are going to eat. Well, I've been, making, I've been making decisions all morning for church, honey. Well, I've been making decisions my entire life, husband. Well, so have I, and I'm older than you, I said. Well, you asked me to marry you, buddy, so all this is on you. That's, what she, that's at the end of that... Well, you're a parent. Okay, so when I get to the parents part, we, I know that we're, we're gone. We can't do that. And it's at this point that I realize we've gotten way away from the ritual, and we, I decide to keep my mouth shut. And, and then we, we move into the it's time to make a suggestion section. And you guys know the rest. Suggestion is met with resistance, right? Oh, no, that's too far away. That, that, we can't go. That's too far away. Then another suggestion met with resistance. No, 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 that's too spicy. We can't. We can't do that. And finally, another suggestion is met. No, you know I don't like that. You know I don't like to go there. That place is, I just don't like that place. So you're saying that to make me make a, a decision, aren't you? You're just saying that to get me to make a decision. And I thought you said you didn't care. Although you shouldn't say that, by the way, if you're a husband. Don't, don't go there. By this time, it's 3 p.m. And our stomachs are literally speaking for us. I don't care where we go. Let's just go somewhere we need to eat. At last, someone will suggest something that we can all agree with, at which point the kids will say, no, we wanted to go to McDonald's. And I'm sure you're wondering what in the world this all has to do with our message today, right? What are we talking about? Where are we going? Well, we're talking about the feeding of the 5,000, if you can imagine that. Just has a little bit different method. Jesus has a little bit different method for feeding these folks than, than say, our ritual out in the lobby. But let's take a look in John chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. Here's what happens in this passage. It's so fascinating. And let's remember what we're talking about, the far side today, right? Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore or the far side of the Sea of Galilee. That is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to even have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will this go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down, about 5,000 men, were there, not to mention their spouses and children. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, 
and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. How many disciples were there again? After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come in the world. All right, now let's look at the far side. Because there's so much going on here. This intersection of where God is, is, is challenging the world and it's the world's understanding through the Messiah. What is the world supposed to think of God, the creator? Since we're talking about these intersections and where the kingdom of heaven collides with our world, let's take a look at the literal location, the far side. Jesus crossed over to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee. The people go out to meet him there. They go out. They go to the far side. This is something really important about meeting Jesus and hearing from him. God wants people and meets people and takes care of people uh, when they are moving out to meet him. We hear echoes of the wilderness here, don't we? When the, when the Israelites are taken out of Egypt and they're out in the wilderness... God takes care of them. Manna begins to fall from heaven. Imagine it like rain. Can you even begin to imagine what would happen to us if manna started falling from heaven? God provides for them when they are in the wilderness. It's also reminiscent of John the Baptist, right? He's leading people to Jesus. He's, he's out somewhere. Remember, he, didn't, he started telling people that the Messiah had come, that, that the Messiah was here, but he didn't do that in town. He did it outside of town he was away from town and the people came to him they heard the news and they were baptized they had come out to meet him it's almost as if there needs to be space in our journey for God to show up what kind of space do we give him how do we go out perhaps this is why we often miss the miracles of Jesus in our world today do you think Jesus does miracles today I believe that he does I, I just wonder if we miss them because we haven't gone out to hear from him. And we often don't leave room for faith in our planning, do we? We, we want to make sure it's all added up. We want to do our due diligence so we don't leave room for faith in our planning. We don't re leave room to hear from him in our schedules. Our schedules are packed tight. We want to make sure that every minute is planned out. And I honestly think this is why camp and retreats have such a powerful impact on people. I, I just want to show of hands, how many of you guys found God at camp or a retreat? Did anybody? Me, anybody else? A few people in here? We have a few people in here that found the Lord at camp or retreat. Or how about a Sunday morning service? Anybody find Jesus, uh, ask Jesus into your heart at a Sunday morning service? A few people in here? I did too. And I think that one of the reasons for that is we set aside time and a place to meet with God, right? This time is set aside, so we're, we're making space. So we go out to meet Jesus. We set aside time and locations just for that so that we can see him and hear him more clearly. It isn't that God isn't working. When we ask, why can't we see God at work? Maybe it's simply because we haven't taken the time to get to know him and what he's up to. We don't know his character. We don't know what he's doing. We don't know his way. Trust me, God is always at work. And if you can't see him, it's not because he's not working. So we go out to the far side. What does that look like in your life to make time and space for him? Second, I want to talk to you about the setup. The setup, and speaking, especially in comedy, you guys know that there's this idea of the setup. You guys know that, right? There's a setup and then a punchline, right? And in the staging of the punch, punchline, that, that's what gets people to laugh. It's this, it's this staging section. So, for example, I, I, I brought this one up for Ryan, our drummer. I just wanted, uh, I wanted him to know that. So what did the drummer call his twin daughters? You guys know? Anna one, Anna two... Sorry, I apologize. Anna one, Anna two. Okay, for example, uh, oh, so though so, so I, 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 I was thinking the idea of joke is to get people moving in one direction and then catch them off guard, right? That's, that's kind of what a joke does. 
Jesus is a master of setups, but it isn't so that he can tell a joke. He's the master of getting people to look one direction, to get their attention on the right thing so that he can reveal something new to them, so that he can catch them off off guard. It's a way for him to teach a lesson. So in the joke, the, the setup is the drummer with the twin girls. You can almost tell that there's more to this story. And without the setup, the punchline has nothing. So I'll give you an example. Here's a punchline. I don't know. It all happened so fast. You guys are laughing. What? You're waiting for the setup, right? You, you already kind of know that it's a joke. You, you need the setup, though. It's not that funny in and of itself. I don't know. It all happened so fast. You need the rest of the context. You need more to the story. You need the setup. So what if I told you that a police officer was asking a victim for a description of four assailants who robbed him, and this was his answer? Well, now it's not funny at all, right? It's not funny. I don't know. It all happened so fast. But we're getting somewhere. In fact, this might be sad, but if we add in the context of who was there... We say it like this, the turtle is robbed by four snails. An officer asks for a description and the turtle says, I don't know, it all happened so fast. Now we're, now we're getting somewhere, right? Now we understand why it's humorous. Now we have the context. Jesus wants everybody looking the right direction. That's why he gives the setup. He's about to reveal something about himself. He wants them to understand that he is the Messiah. But he also wants to understand wants them to understand what the Messiah is doing in our world today. It's not just that he wants them to know that he's the Messiah. That's an important piece. But he wants them to understand what it is that the Messiah is up to. So he asks his disciples, he says, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? And they're aghast, right? What do you mean? Where are we going to buy bread? What, what do you mean? That the total of the cost to even give a single person, we can't do that. We We would have no way of doing that. We wouldn't be able to eat for half a year. They can't afford to buy a bite of bread for each person, let alone feed all of these people, right? Jesus' request, Jesus' question is the setup. Here's this part that just is astonishing to me. There's this part where Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, does something just, it doesn't make sense in the world today. It's an act of faith that is ridiculous when you think about it. But he sets two examples for us that we we really need to pay attention to. The first thing is he does the right thing first. And the second thing is he asks the right question second. Do the right thing, then ask the right question. Let's start with the right thing, the thing that he does. I love the picture here that John sets. It's almost as if one of the disciples is talking about how impossible it will be to feed all these people. And right as he's saying that, as this is happening, Andrew goes and gets this little boy who he saw with five loaves and two fish and brings him to Jesus. And I've been thinking about this in my own life. We always put limitations on God, don't we? We, we put those limitations based upon what we can see and hear and touch. That's, that's kind of what we do. But Andrew brings what he can find and goes to the right place. He brings whatever he has. This boy with five loaves and two fish, he brings them to Jesus. He does the right thing. So when you encounter a problem, bring what you have and give it to Jesus. The next thing he does is he asks the right question. How far will they go among so many? He's wondering how many people are going to get fed. How how far can this go? He sees it and and he knows the, the limitations of the bread and the fish. He understands it because he's got the basket right there. Five, you know, five pieces of bread or five loaves of bread and two fish. And he's, he's looking at it and he's looking at the people and he's confused about how far this can go. But he asks the right question. He knows the answer. If he's looking at it, he knows what the answer is. This could probably feed maybe us, a few of us. But he asks the question, kind of almost a faithful question. How far far can this go? What can you do with this, Jesus? He wouldn't have brought the boy to Jesus if he didn't think something could be done. Remember the water and the wine? 
Remember the official son that was saved from fever and the invalid that stood up and walked? Maybe Andrew was catching on to something because you can almost hear Jesus' mom in the back of his mind. Can't you? We have a problem. Do what Jesus says. If we do what Jesus says, then something Something great can happen. Something miraculous can happen. And Andrew didn't know how it was going to get done, but he knew he wanted to be a part of it. So he gathers this little boy and these five loaves and these two fish and he brings them to Jesus and then asks, how far can this go? Maybe it's the, maybe it's the way that we ask the question, right? How far could this go? Maybe it's how far can this go? When we offer ourselves to Jesus, we don't know how far it can go. So he brought the boy and he asked the right question. I want to share some things with you that I think maybe are a little, uh, a, a little bit difficult for us to kind of comprehend sometimes. Because what Jesus is doing is not... Um, it doesn't make earthly sense, right? Have you heard that before? It doesn't make earthly sense. So as you go back to the scripture for just a minute, I think it's really interesting that this all happens at the Jewish Passover festival. That it happens at the Passover. You remember what the Passover was, right? The, the Israelites were going to Pharaoh. They asked him, They told him, we need to go. We need to be out of here. And Pharaoh says no. And then all of these things happen until the point where there was going to be death in the community. And the Israelites painted over their doorways with lamb's blood. And the angel of death passes over those houses. Doesn't take their firstborn. It was... It was a celebration of how God continues us, continues our, our, our blessing, takes care of us. And, and Jesus does this all at the Passover festival. It's important for us to understand not just what Jesus was doing, but the fact that he's doing it at this particular time. What is it that Jesus wants to get across to his hearers? What does he want to say? Well, I think there are a few things that that Jesus wants to say, number one, I think he wants us to remember to go to the far side to meet him. In other words, set a time, set a place, set aside energy. We talk about tithing around here. What is tithing? It's your first fruits. What if you did that not just with your money, but with your time? What if you did that with your energy? What, what, what time frame of the day would God get if he got your best time and your best energy. See, if you want to see Jesus at work and you want to hear his voice, you need to go out to meet him and give him your best. Does that mean you have to go into the woods? I don't, I don't think about that. I, I don't think about going out into the woods, although maybe that's something you need to do. I, I don't particularly like going out into the woods. I, you know, if I'm going to go camping, it's going to be glamping. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I don't, I don't really want to be in the woods, per se, but I do need to go out to meet Jesus. I think about it in a spiritual sense, to get away from my busyness, to set aside a place in your home, in your office, set aside a place in your schedule, turn off your social media and electronics just to be with Jesus, just to be with him. And what happens in those moments is you begin to get comfortable with the quiet and you read your Bible and you start to hear his voice because it's in those quiet places that God is speaking. Or maybe he's always speaking, but it's just too noisy to hear. When you encounter a problem, remind yourself that problems are the setup. Is that what you do with your problems? No, me neither. It's hard, right? I mean, you look, at the, you look at the issues that are going on, and man, it just feels so crushing sometimes. But if we think about it from a heavenly perspective, we think about it from a kingdom perspective, the truth is that, that that's the setup for God to do something incredible. Remember the joke? When you encounter a problem, there are parts of it. This is a setup. 
The context matters, so pay attention to what is going on around the issue, what's happening around your issue. Ask yourself the things that make up the context. Who, what, when, where, and why? What's going on in that? Why, why are you encountering this problem? Who is this problem about? What is going on? When is this problem? What's the timeline? Where are you? See, they're all part of the setup. And when you start asking these questions and you see it as a setup, then you can stop telling God what is impossible like some of the disciples and you can just offer what you have to him. Stop telling him what's impossible. Stop telling him what he can't do. Ask the right question. Go to Jesus, offer what you have, and ask this question, how? You can look around and you can see the who, what, when, where, and why. But then you need to ask the, the how. The final question that gets asked by investigators and journalists as they go through these, who, what, when, where, why, is how. The answer is a practice in faith. We go to Jesus and we offer what we have. We don't say, Jesus, I don't know how you're going to do this. I mean, I've got five loaves and two fishes, but... How is that going to feed anybody? I mean, how far can that go? We take what we have and we offer it to him. And even though it doesn't make sense, we say, well, how far can this go? How far can, how far can this go? Some people have been asking me that about my goatee. How far can this go? And I don't know. I'm gonna, I just wanted to prove that I can grow hair. That's what I really wanted to do. I just wanted to prove... That even though there's nothing up there, I can't, I can, but sometimes it doesn't make sense, does it? As a congregation, we have things at our disposal that we can offer God. As individuals, we have things that, at our disposal that we can offer God. But here's the thing, at best, what we have to offer is five loaves and two fish. That's, that's what we have. That's what we have at best. At best, this is what we get to give God, and that's perfectly okay as long as we go to the right person and ask the right question. We might not be asking how to feed 5,000 people, but we might be asking, how am I going to get through to my next paycheck? How am I going to make it through the loss of my loved one? How am I going to get through this situation at work? How am I going to get through it? God, what are you going to do? God, you can't do anything about this. I've seen, I've seen all this before. It happens like this all the time, and, and these things don't get fixed unless, unless you start reading Scripture, unless you start hearing from God, and your eyes are open to the things that he does. Because then you start seeing, oh, it doesn't always happen that way. In fact, sometimes God steps in. And here's the thing that we really need to grasp, is that he will ultimately step in for all things. You may be like me, and you might be asking God, how is this little church going to make a kingdom-sized impact on the world? And I don't know the answer to that question. I have no idea. But I know I want to offer it to the Lord. I know I want to say, how far can this go? And just offer it up to God. So what do you say, friends? What problems have you encountered? What problems are you going through right now? Now, what's the setup in your life right now? What's going on? And are you willing to accept it as a setup? Are you willing to stop talking about the impossibilities and take what you have and give it to Jesus? That's the question today. All right, let's bow our heads and let's close our eyes for just a minute. And we're, gonna, we're just going to take some time. We're just going to settle into this moment. And we're going to set it aside for God. God, this is your time and this is your place. It's been sanctified for you. And if, if there are people that are watching online right now, God, I know that they can do this right there in their homes. We can all do this right in our homes where we can just say, okay, God, this time and this space is set apart for you. It's sanctified to you. We're giving this to you so that you can do the things that you do because we can only do so much.
And God, as my mind begins to turn this morning, and I start thinking about the ways that I've seen you show up in different places, I, I, I think about places that I want to see you show up right now. I think about things that I want to see you do right now. I think about people that I want to see you rescue right now, God. There's, there's too much for me or even us to be capable of, of seeing the kind of change that we need, God. And I think about it not only just on an individual perspective, but then I start thinking about the, 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 the largeness of it, of it all. How my city needs to be impacted. How my state needs to be impacted. How my country needs to be impacted. How my world needs to be impacted. God, sometimes when I fly back from back east, I find myself looking over the breadth of this Southern California area, and I think, God, what difference can we make? It's too big. There's too many people. I mean, it would take a miracle to spiritually feed all of these people. For them to come to know you and and grow in you. I mean, what hope is there, God? But there's this little part of me, God, today that's been challenged to offer you the loaves and the fish that I have. To say to you, God, how far can this go? And I don't know the answer, but I am 100% sure I'm going to the right person and asking the right question, God. Today, I just want to give you myself and my family and everything that we have. I want to give you our church and just say, God, how far can this go? In my hands, it's five loaves and two fish. In your hands, it's a miracle. God, I think about people who are part of our church and who aren't part of our church. God, that are going through issues right now. Going through relationship things or addiction things. They're going through financial things, God, and they just, they don't know how it's going to work out. They don't know how it's going to I don't know how it's going to get from the dark to the light. And yet we look back, God, and so many times we see that that's your movement, that it's not from light to dark. Although it felt like that for us, maybe. We felt like we were in a light place, and, and now it's a dark world, and, and we, we need you to shed light into our situation again. And God, we're going to you because... Because that's our only hope. God, so take the loaves and the fish, whatever we call it. I mean, our energy doesn't feel like much that we have to give. Our time doesn't feel like much that we have to give. Our emotions, God, are weighed down. We don't feel like we have much to give. God, what we have, we're going to offer to you today. Because we believe that right here in this place and in this moment, the kingdom of heaven and earth, the temporary world that we live in are colliding right now. And that you are here. And these problems are just a setup if we'll bring what we have to you, God. 
and offer it to you. And so today we do that. We give whatever we have left. The best of what we have, God, it might not even feel like very much. In fact, it probably doesn't feel like much at all. But we give it to you. And today we ask God, how far will this go? God, I pray that you would put this church on mission so that not only would we see our problems, our own problems as a setup, but when we hear about a problem for someone else, that it would be a setup for God, for for you to work through us. God, we want to be a part of those those miracles that happen in other people's lives. We want to be part of the answers to prayers that people are praying right now. And if we set aside time and we set aside energy and we get close to you, maybe you'll open our eyes and our ears to hear those things in the way that you hear them. And maybe, just maybe, we'll hear from you and you'll say something like, I want you to give your loaves and your fish in this moment. God, I don't know how that's going to work. God, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. God, I'm not sure what I can do to make a difference in this person's life. But here's my loaves and my fish. How far will this go? God, we give it all to you. Maybe there's some people in here right now, God, that they don't know you. Maybe there's some, somebody watching online right now. They don't know you yet. But they're wondering about their own lives, where their lives are headed. Maybe they want a God that can step into their temporary situation with eternal solutions. God, if there's anybody like that here today, I ask that you would just open their minds and open their hearts to the possibility that they're not stuck where they are if you're in their lives. If that's you today, I just ask that you'd raise your hand and you would say, yep, that's me. I want to know that, God. You're not stuck, friend. You're not stuck. You don't have to be who you've always been. God wants to make you a new creation. If you'll just ask today, Heavenly Father, forgive me of the ways that I've messed up. Come into my heart and make me a new creation. I trust you and I believe in you. This God will do that for you. And I invite you to tell somebody about it, to let somebody know, a good friend or even a pastor, me, myself, or Pastor Kim, or... Pastor Lucinda or a a person that's deep in their faith that you might know, just tell them what God has done in your life. This is a great first step for you. And Heavenly Father, for anyone that raised their hand today, I just say thank you, God, for our new brothers and sisters in spirit. Thank you, God, for giving us even even a glimpse of the hope that you might bring to us. I pray that that hope would turn into faith, would turn into something that we see and hear and touch. Bring it to life, God. Bring that hope to life. Maybe you're saying, Pastor Doug, I I believe in Jesus, but I've got a problem that just seems too big. I've got an issue that just seems too big. I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know how God is going to deal with it. But I want to take everything that I have, and I want to give it to him. And I want to offer him the loaves and the fish in my life. And I want to ask him today, how far will this go? Is there anybody like that? Thanks. Anybody like that today? Heavenly Father, you see those that are raising their hand right now. God, you know, even in my own life, I I look at, you know, what, what a church is supposed to accomplish. 
how we're supposed to impact communities and how we're supposed to impact people's lives, God. And I just, I don't know how it happens. And I'm just being honest this morning, God. It doesn't, it, it doesn't seem like it can happen without you, without a miracle. God, when relationships are so broken, sometimes it doesn't seem like there's any hope except for you. When finances seem so short, it just doesn't seem like there's any hope except for you. God, this day, this day, we not only set aside the things that we have at our disposal. We set ourselves aside. We ask you to set us apart so that we can do your kingdom's work and that you can do your kingdom's work in us. God, that somehow in this miraculous world that we live in where we wake up and take a breath and the sun rises and the rain comes and we get to wake up here, the gift that you've given to us sometimes doesn't feel like a gift. It feels like, it feels like a prison sentence. Sometimes we feel trapped by all the things that are going on around us, God, but, but that's not the case with you. Maybe we feel like we've got a problem that's like feeding 5,000 men and their families, but, uh, but we read this story today. we hear the good news of a great God who sent his one and only son to show what the kingdom of heaven is like. And what we see, God, is you're not captive by any of the things that we think that we're captive, captives of. What we see, God, is that what we see and hear and smell and taste and touch, they're they're, they're worldly things. They're temporary things. Help us to be like Andrew. To take what we have. Help us to offer it up to you and ask the right question, God. Let us take it to you. Let us take our, our last few dollars. Let us take our, our last few good emotions. Let us take our last little bit of hope for that relationship and give it to the God who made all things. Whose son came to be like us and be one of us and yet shows us that the kingdom of heaven is different. Raise up your kingdom in our hearts and in our minds, God, so that so that we might see how you see we might hear how you hear. That when we look at our problems, we would see that you are the solution. God, we love you. We give you praise and honor and glory today and always. Amen.